Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I have the new Core i3-13100 on hand for testing. And I've also purchased the Core i5-13400 and of course the 13500. So I'll have some detailed testing on these processors shortly. But for now, I wanted to take a look at the Core i3 model as the previous version, the 12100. That's been one of my favorite budget CPUs of the past year. So I'm keen to see what the updated 13th gen version has to offer. But before we do, Today's video is sponsored by Gigabyte and their Aorus and Aero RTX 30 series laptops. These excellent machines for gamers and creators are powered by up to an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 Ti graphics card and up to Intel Core i9 processors. Gamers will be interested in the Aorus 17X featuring high performance GeForce RTX graphics, support for DLSS and ray tracing, a super fast 360Hz display and heaps of cooling power. For creators, check out the Aero 16 with its 4K OLED display, portable form factor, and efficient GeForce RTX GPU. There's plenty of other options in Gigabyte's lineup as well, so learn more via the links below. Okay, so Intel does claim that the new Core i3-13100 is based on the new Raptor Lake architecture, but in reality, it's little more than a rebadge 12100 with a small bump to the clock speeds. For example, the L2 cache capacity, it's just 1.25 megabytes per core, and Raptor Lake CPUs are meant to offer two megabytes per core. So calling a 13100 a Raptor Lake processor is a little bit disingenuous, and I suppose calling a 13th gen part to begin with is probably a bit disingenuous as well. In short, when compared to the 12100, the 13100 base clocks have been boosted by 100 megahertz, and the turbo clocks by 200 megahertz. And other than that, they're pretty much identical. They both pack 5 megabytes of L2 cache, 12 megabytes of L3 cache, a maximum turbo rating of 89 watts. By default, they support DDR5 4800 or 3200 memory, along with 16 lanes of PCI Express 5.0 and 4 lanes of PCIe 4.0. So, what we're talking about here is up to a 5% increase in clock speed for the new 13100. That's it. Worse still, the 13100 currently costs $150 US whereas the 12100 can be had for $133, making the newer 13th generation version 13% more expensive. Given all of that, you might be wondering why I'm actually bothering to test the 13100 at all, and initially, I thought I'd probably just skip it. But having recommended the 12100 for the better part of last year, and with so much movement and pricing for these lower end parts, I thought it was a segment that really warranted a revisit, so here we are. But rather than go through the standard review format that we've already done for the 12100, I thought a GPU scaling benchmark would be far more interesting. So for comparison, we have the Ryzen 5 5600 and 5500, along with the original Core i3-12100. Now, when the Core i3-12100 first arrived, there was basically no competition from AMD. They had the Ryzen 3 3100 at $175, which was a ridiculous price for that part and the Ryzen 5 5600G, which was even worse at $260. And you have to remember back then, Zen 3 was similar to what we find today with Zen 4. Everyone loves to rave about the value of Zen 3, with parts such as the 5800X3 dropping as low as $330, and the 5600 now available for $150, but it hasn't always been that way. Just a year ago, neither CPU existed, as both arrived in April. And then back when the 5600 was released, it cost $200. So the MSRP for that part, while the 5600X, that was more like $230. And remember, the MSRP for that part was $300. At the same time, AMD also introduced the Ryzen 5 5500 for $160. And since then, that part has dropped to a much more appropriate $100. The 5600 has also dropped to $150. So the same asking price as the new 13100. That all means today we have the Core i3-12100 for $133, and the new Core i3-13100 for $150, and these parts will be competing with the AMD Ryzen 5 5500 at $100, and then the 5600 at $150. So there's significantly more competition from AMD today in the sub $200 US price range when compared to this time last year. Now, given that this is a GPU scaling benchmark, we're obviously focusing on gaming performance, and in total, we have a dozen games, all of which have been tested at 1080p using the Radeon RX 6650 XT, 6950 XT, and RTX 4090. And of course, the reason for testing at 1080p is very simple. We want to minimize the GPU bottleneck as we're looking at CPU performance. But also, by including a number of different GPUs, we still get to view the effects of GPU bottlenecks on CPU performance. 
As for the test systems, we're using DDR4 memory exclusively here as the older but much cheaper memory standard makes sense when talking about sub $200 processors, though there are certainly scenarios where we would opt for DDR5, but for simplicity's sake, we're going for an apples to apples comparison here with DDR4. And for this apples to apples comparison, I've decided to use G-Skills Ripped Jaws V-Series 32GB DDR4-3600 CL16 memory, because at $115 US, it is a good quality kit that offers a nice balance of price to performance. The AM4 processors are able to run this kit at the 3600 spec, using the standard CL16-19-19-36 timings, but the locked Intel processors can't run above 3466 if you want to use the Gear 1 mode, and ideally, you want to use the Gear 1 mode as the memory has to run above 4000 before Gear 2 can match Gear 1. And the reason for this limitation is due to the fact that the system agent or SA voltage is locked for non k SKU processors, and this limits the memory controller's ability to support high frequency memory while maintaining gear 1 mode. So that being the case, I've tested the 12100 and 13100 using the Ripjaws memory adjusted to 3466, as this is the most optimal configuration for these processors short of going and manually tuning memory subtimings, which we're not doing for this content. So let's get into the benchmark graphs. First up, we have the Watch Dogs Legion results, and there's quite a bit to discuss here. Firstly, what will probably jump out the most at you here is the fact that in a number of instances, the lowly Radeon RX 6650 XT is actually faster than the RTX 4090, and if you happen to miss all of my NVIDIA overhead content, this will look a bit wrong to you. I'm not going to explain the issue in detail here, but in short, NVIDIA's architecture is designed in a way that creates more driver overhead for the CPU, meaning when performance is CPU limited, frame rates take a bigger hit when using a GeForce GPU opposed to a Radeon GPU. So in some instances, a much lower end product like the 6650 XT can actually end up being faster than the RTX 4090 as the CPU simply can't keep up. Of course, you'd never pair a Core i3-13100 with an RTX 4090, but the same effect can be observed with much lower end GeForce GPUs, but we're not here to explore that in this video. As I said, we've done that in previous videos. What we are here to explore is Ryzen 5 5600 and Core i3-13100 CPU performance, and when using the 6650 XT, we see that the 5600 is 6% faster when comparing the average frame rate, but 17% faster when comparing 1% lows, and that's a surprisingly big margin given the GPU that we're using for testing here. So upgrading to the 6950 XT, that blows the average out to 25% in favor of the 5600 and 30% for the 1% lows. We're also looking at similar margins using the RTX 4090 despite the frame rates overall being lower. Here the 5600 is 26% faster than the 13100 or 28% faster when comparing 1% lows. Now the 13100 is also at most 2% faster than the 12100 in this testing, while the Ryzen 5 5500 comfortably beats both Core i3 processors. Now the Warhammer 3 scaling is very different to what we're seeing in Watch Dogs Legion. Using the high quality preset, we see that the 6650 XT is capped to around 80 FPS, and all four processors were capable of reaching those limits, so a hard GPU bottleneck here. The 6950 XT though, that largely removes those limits, and now the 5600 is 9% faster than the 13100 when comparing the average frame rate, and 20% faster for the 1% lows. Then armed with the RTX 4090, those margins increased to 23% for the average frame rate, and a 25% advantage for the Ryzen 5 processor when comparing 1% lows. So a clear win here for the 5600, and even the 5500 was a good bit faster than the 13100 in much of this testing. Next we have Hitman 3, and here we have some more interesting results. Firstly, when paired with the 6650 XT, all four CPUs again produced similar frame rates of around 110 FPS. However, with the 6950 XT, the margins are quite different. The 5500 roughly matched the Core i3s, but the 5600 was 14% faster than the 13100, and a massive 24% faster when comparing 1% lows. Yet despite that, the margins again close up with the RTX 4090, we even see 1% lows tank, presumably due to the additional overhead, but this could just also be an issue with the GeForce drivers. In any case, now the 5600 is 12% faster than the 13100 when comparing the average frame rate, and just 8% faster when comparing 1% lows. A Plague Tale Requiem is both a GPU and CPU demanding game, though here we are using the ultra quality settings for this single player story driven title, and as a result the 6650 XT is only good for just over 60 FPS. 
The Ryzen 5 5500 does struggle in this title, and there seems to be a latency penalty to pay here with the much smaller L3 cache. Again, with these lower-end processors, the 6950 XT is much faster than the RTX 4090 at 1080p, and in fact, the 5600 was 25% faster using the Radeon GPU, so pretty crazy stuff, but not surprising given what we've learned in past benchmarks. In terms of CPU performance though, the Ryzen 5 5600 and Core i3 13100 appear very evenly matched in this title. Next up we have the Modern Warfare 2 multiplayer benchmark, and here we see when using the 6650 XT that performance is fairly similar across all four processors. The 5600 for example did nudge ahead for the average frame rate, but it was only 6% faster than the 13100, so not a big margin there. The 6950 XT though, that does hand the 5600 a 20% win when looking at the average frame rate and 22% for the 1% lows when compared to the 13100. That's interesting because when using the RTX 4090, the 5600 was 14% faster than the 13100 for the average frame rate, but a massive 33% faster when comparing 1% lows. So the additional overhead of the GeForce GPU is really hurting the Core i3s in this test. Spider-Man Remastered is both very CPU and GPU demanding, especially when using ray tracing like we are here. These results are extremely CPU bound, as we see little difference in performance between all three GPUs. Quite unexpectedly though, the Core i3 processors perform best with the Radeon GPUs, beating even the Ryzen 5 5600. Using the 6950 XT for example saw the 13100 beat the 5600 by an 11% margin. Yet despite that we find very different results with the RTX 4090. Here the GeForce GPU cripples the 1% lows of the Core i3s, handing the 5600 a 20% performance advantage, so very mixed results in Spider-Man Remastered. Moving on to a benchmark classic, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Somehow this is still one of the most CPU demanding single player games we have to test with, and it was released back in 2018. To be clear, the built-in benchmark is not very CPU demanding and isn't suitable for CPU testing, it's more of a GPU benchmark, so therefore we are testing in-game, we're testing in the village section which is very CPU demanding. Here the 6650 XT capped out at around 110 FPS using the highest quality preset, and all four CPUs were able to achieve that performance target. However, going beyond that with the 6950 XT saw the Core i3s left behind, and now the 5600 is up to 21% faster than the 13100, so an easy win here for AMD. Then with the RTX 4090, which increased CPU load further, the 5600 is now 27% faster than the 13100, or a massive 36% faster when comparing 1% lows. Now, Horizon Zero Dawn. The results show all four CPUs maxing out the 6650 XT at between 120 and 130 FPS. But when we move to the 6950 XT, the 12100, 13100, and 5500 all delivered around 160 FPS, but the 5600 went on to render 189 FPS. That made it 12% faster than the 13100, and that margin grew to 22% with the RTX 4090. Next up we have Cyberpunk 2077, and this game is very GPU bound with the 6650 XT, even when using the medium quality settings. Then once again, due to the overhead issue, all four CPUs actually delivered higher performance, with the 6950 XT opposed to the RTX 4090. The 5600 for example, that was 12% faster using the Radeon GPU. It was also 15% faster than the Core i3 13100, so another comfortable win here for the Zen 3 processor. ACC is a very CPU demanding driving simulator, and here we're using the medium quality preset, which typically makes this title far more CPU bound than GPU bound using modern hardware. As a result, frame rates are almost identical using either the 6650 XT or 6950 XT. Using the faster of the two Radeon GPUs, the 5600 was just 7% faster than the 13100, while the 5500 was just nowhere. L3 cache performance is super important in this title, which is why the 5500 struggles, and parts like the 5800X 3D really shine. The Rift Breaker is a very CPU demanding game, though like most CPU demanding games, it relies heavily on the primary thread, so single core performance is still very important, and we see this when comparing the 5600 and 13100. The 5500 also struggles here as IPC is well down thanks to the much smaller L3 cache. Finally we have Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and this title is heavily CPU limited as visually the game hasn't really been overhauled in a very long time. 
Using the 6650XT, the 5600 was 17% fast than the 13100, or 11% faster when comparing 1% lows. The 5500 was the slowest of the four CPUs tested, with the 13100 up to 19% faster. Still, for the most part, performance was similar between the 5500 and Core i3s. Okay, so here's the 12 game average, and as we often saw, when using the 6650 XT, performance was very similar across all four CPUs due to the GPU bottleneck. But there were some variants, mostly with the 5500. The 5600 though, that was on average just 3% faster than the 13100, so within 5% which we typically deem to be a tie. Now, largely removing the GPU bottleneck with the 6950 XT sees the 5600 pull ahead of the 13100, by an 11% margin, or 12% when comparing 1% lows. So a decent performance advantage there, and we saw similar margins when using the GeForce RTX 4090. It's amazing how much the PC parts landscape can change in less than a year. AMD went from being the king of budget CPUs just a few years ago now, to pretty well nowhere this time last year, and now they're back to being the obvious choice. To be fair though, I was a bit slow with this update. The Ryzen 5 5600 did drop as low as $150 back in August of last year, though it did rise back up to $190 for a few months, and then it dropped as low as $120 US, so it's been a bit all over the place. At present, it's back up to $150, but with the Core i3-13100 entering the market at that price, this is an easy win for AMD. It's also worth noting that the 13100F, that can be had for $125, while the 12100F is selling for as little as $110, so those F SKUs are decent options at those prices. But if you want to save as much money as possible, the Ryzen 5 5500 is really hard to beat at $100 right now. Not to mention if you go AM4, you do have the option of upgrading to something like the 5800X 3D in the future for a massive FPS boost. Right now that CPU is selling for as little as $340 US, though to be fair, the Core i3s can be upgraded to something like the 13600K for similar money, and the Core i5 also offers a similar gaming experience to that of the 3D vCache part. So although both platforms are effectively dead, there are plenty of solid upgrade options on offer. For the Core i3-13100 to really compete with the Ryzen 5 5600 though, it needs to cost no more than $100 as there are to be a toss up between the i3s and the 5500. At $150 though, it's obviously dead on arrival, and even $125 for the F SKU, it's just a bit too much. That really needs to be a sub $100 offering. Also, keep in mind that just a week ago, the Ryzen 5 5600 was selling for as little as $135, so pricing for that part has consistently hovered between $120 and $200 US. So if you are interested, I'd recommend watching listings for a few weeks, as there's a good chance you'll be able to land one for a lot closer to $120 US. As for the GPU scaling side of things, we saw some really interesting results, though nothing out of the ordinary given past findings with Nvidia's driver overhead issue. I know a lot of you will be wishing the 7900 XTX had been added to this testing, and I have to admit, after going over all the data, I was sort of missing it as well. But truth be told, for sub $200 US parts, those uber expensive GPUs are only included more for scientific testing and I guess future proofing to a certain degree. And if you guys enjoyed this testing, I can certainly do a lot more of it over the coming weeks and months. I think adding the Ryzen 5 7600 to this data for comparison with the 5600, that could be really interesting. That's one I want to see. But of course, let me know what CPUs you'd like to see added to the data and I'll see what I can do. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to support work like this more directly, we have Floatplane and Patreon. You can subscribe to either one of those. It'll give you access to monthly live streams, our exclusive Discord server, behind the scenes content, Q and A's, a lot of cool stuff. So check it out if you're interested. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.